Welcome back to another episode of Sweet Script Stories. I'm Eric Grubaugh. And I'm Tim Dietrich. And today we want to talk about going solo in the NetSuite development space. We are both solo operators. I've been doing it for about five years, and Tim for how long? <laughs> too long. <laughs> All right, too long. Tim for too long. Um, really quick, a disclaimer at the top of this. We are not accountants, we are not attorneys, and we are not financial advisors. So anything we say in, in those regards, uh, please take with a grain of salt and consult an actual one of those people before taking action on our our comments here. So, assuming that people are going to take action on our comments, true. we might that, scare that, them away. <laughs> that was very presumptive of me. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So, uh, like I said, I've been doing this for, you know, on my own for five years, you've been doing it for much longer. So Tim, how did you, how did you go solo? Why did you go solo? What, what pushed you into this wild madness of a lifestyle? Yeah. So, I mean, not to be funny or anything, but yeah, I, I first went solo back in May of 2000. So it's been a long time. Um, and it has not century. been a, just a constant, uh, you know, I've been on my own, you know, for that entirety for 20 years, there've been times where I've been, I, I used the word earlier, um, Lord into taking a, you know, full-time position with some, you know, with different companies over the years is that grass is always greener kind of thing. Um, but one way or another, I'm, you know, I sort of always end up back working for myself. And, um, and that's a story in and of itself, I guess. But when I first went solo, I, I did it because I had come to realize that I really wasn't cut out to work in a corporate environment. I, you know, I had no interest in sort of climbing the corporate ladder. And I think more importantly, I didn't want to get to a point where I had to manage people. I was kind of being pushed into that. And I think as a developer, it's easy to, you know, eventually you reach a point where you become like the lead developer or whatever, and you're kind of asked uh, almost by default to manage either other developers or a team of developers and designers, whatever, you know, depending on the, the situation there. And that's just not me. Um, I don't think I'm as much of a people person as I would need to be to be effective at that. <laughs> sure. um, so, you know, it was a sort of a self-realization, I guess, that I was, uh, you know, my my best bet was to try to go solo. And I, I was lucky enough to kind of grow up in an entrepreneurial family. My mom and dad had started a business when I was a freshman in college and, um, I ended up working for them and helping them automate their business and so on and so forth. So I got to see what it was like to run a business, um, you know, in that was you know, a real education, a great education. So I, I think I had that sort of entrepreneurial spirit uh, as a result of that. And, you know, at the time that I went so uh, the, the first time, it was kind of at the height of the dot com era. Right. It's probably more on the side, but like I kind of saw that it was going to fall apart. I, I could, the stories I could tell you about dot coms are, <laughs> again, another episode, uh, or maybe stories best told over a beer. <laughs> sure. Um, but anyway, it was the height of the dot com era. And uh, the work that I was doing, which is web and database integration, which ironically is pretty much what I'm still doing, uh, but it was in really high demand at the time. So I had a pretty good feeling that I could make it on my own. Uh, like I, I figured that if nothing else, I could, you know, put my tail between my legs and go back and, you know, get a job if I needed to. Um, so I felt pretty good about it at the time. You know, I really felt like it was the right thing to do. Um, it, it was a good time to do it. So I did it. <laughs> So how about you? Like, what was what were the circumstances around you going solo? Um, I have always wanted to go solo. I can remember having thoughts of running my own business 
uh, as far back as like late high school, uh, which is strange. I don't have any entrepreneurs in any of my like close circle of friends or my family. There are basically zero entrepreneurs. So I'm not really sure where that came from. I didn't know at the time what I wanted to do by any means, but I got to a similar point in my NetSuite career where there's definitely a, a point in a technical career where you can sort of stay where you are or switch companies or take the management track. Not a lot of companies do a great job at leveraging really senior technical resources and or giving them room to grow. So um, I saw a good opportunity. I tried the management track. I loved it, mostly, almost all of it. <laughs> Some parts were terrible, but I do enjoy that work, which is why I work with leaders and managers with teams now. But... I saw an opportunity. I saw a, or thought I saw um, a gap in the market of, of the NetSuite space where there just was not enough educational content. I would say there's still not enough educational content. And I tried to, I thought I could help. So I tried to do that. I had a good idea. I had a good uh, runway. I had a supportive partner. And so I took the opportunity and I tried it. Interesting. Yeah. So that you mentioned, um, you know, your partner, uh, having the support there and yeah. I, I didn't say anything about that, but not only did I have, um, my wife's support, but ironically, or funny enough, uh, we both left really cushy jobs to go solo at the same time. So she was a web designer. I was a web developer. We weren't working at the same company. Um, but when I left and went solo, she did as well. And um, that was interesting. <laughs> so we went from two, uh, you know, solid you know, full-time positions, nice salaries to just going both essentially going solo together. <laughs> so I thought I, I should mention that too. And that, but that does help, right? I mean, to some extent it makes it even more frightening, but um, you know, we were both going through the experience of working for ourselves um, simultaneously. So at least we could, we knew, you know, what the other one was going through to some yeah. extent. So that that's, was... that's something I have written down much later in my notes, but finding peers or not even really peers, but yeah, people going through something similar, finding yourself a small cohort or even one person to commiserate with on, on what self-employment is like is yeah is super critical right and i would argue that that's uh that's true when you're doing it when you're initially going solo mm -hmm. but it's also important to continue to have that kind of a support group i mean you and i have been that you know to each other now for several months right you know let's and, be honest that's basically what this show is yeah it pretty much is <laughs> um and it's, it's been very, very helpful to me, uh, hopefully to you too. You know, it's like good to be able to bounce ideas off of each other, to commiserate, uh, you know, to cheer each other on at times, <laughs> to be a sounding board and so on. And uh, yeah, so I think it's important not only starting out, but, you know, hold on to that if you can find it. And because you're going to need that support, it's not like you only need it in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been doing this for more than 20 years now in one fashion or another. And, you know, it's you know, having somebody to talk to is very helpful you know, yeah. even now, maybe I, more so now than ever. <laughs> right. I think the beginning is actually the easy part. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but yeah, the beginning is the easy part. Uh, right. So it, it's just fear in the beginning. 
it gets more complicated as things go on, mm -hmm. <laughs> which seems counterintuitive, but we can talk about that. Um, so before we like get too deep into this, I think maybe the first thing I want to say is self-employment is not for everyone. Would you agree? I totally agree. Um, and it's something that it's, you know, from the outside looking in, it looks, I don't know, depending on who I talk to, um, they either think that it's the greatest thing ever and they want to do it and want to know how to do it. Or I've had people say to me, oh, I can't even imagine working on, you know, working by myself or for myself. Like they just completely shut down. They will not even consider mm -hmm. it at all, mostly out of fear. And sadly, mostly out of fear involving, um, I would not just money in general, but like health insurance seems to be the number one thing when, I, when people say to me, you know, oh, I would love to go out on my own, but I can't afford life insurance or health insurance or whatever. Like, and we can talk about that too later. Mm -hmm. But um, so there are some people who just immediately dismiss the idea of it. But I will agree that it isn't for everyone. And I think that there are certain uh, characteristics that if you, if you don't have these, you know, some of these characteristics, I don't, this probably isn't the right thing for you. Um, I would love top, to hear your characteristics. So the, at the top of it, you absolutely have to be disciplined. If you're not self-disciplined, you're not going to, um, I, just, I can't imagine being successful at this because no one is going to help you with that, you know, other than angry clients, I guess. You have to do the work. You have to get up every morning or every weekday morning or whatever, most weekday mornings, mm -hmm. and do the work, right? I mean, that's that's the number one thing. And that's, that's not just getting up and writing code. I mean, it's dealing with all the things that go into running a business you know, proposals and you know the the bookkeeping aspect of it and taxes and so on um so you have to be self-disciplined i think um yeah that brings up a really good point if you first of all someone has to get those clients in the first place there's there's no boss there's no one telling you what to do there's no marketing team there's no sales team you have to be the one to get those clients in the first place in order for them to motivate you to do more work. If yeah. you, if you just, if the only thing you want to do is like sit at a desk and be great at the thing you want to do, if say, so for instance, sweet script development, if you just want to be a great sweet script developer, stay with a job, don't start a business. Yeah, or if I would, I guess I would say that it is possible to minimize the things that go into running a business so that you can really focus on the thing that you want to be doing. As a matter of fact, I would say that's that should be one of your goals if you're going solo. Try to find a way to reduce or eliminate, if possible, like all the, the the baggage, the craziness that comes with running your own business. Um, it's hard to do. You know? um, but like to your point there, you know, that's one of the bullet points I have here is you have to be able to wear many hats and assume many roles. It's not just development. You know, you're the developer, you're the solution architect, you're the salesperson, you're the bookkeeper, you're the guy who takes the trash out, the orders lunch, hopefully, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, it's just, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. And that makes it interesting at times. Sometimes changing those hats is a relief, you know, switching from being the developer to hopping on a call to talk to a prospect or putting together a proposal, you know, Sometimes that can be fun mm -hmm. and a nice change of pace. And other times it's just, you know, you think to yourself, man, you know, all I want to do is write code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are some days where I don't write a single line of code and it drives me nuts, you know, and uh, those are the It's every days. day for me. Well, yeah, but that's the difference. <laughs> I have a different business, so. <laughs> yeah. I would say if you, 
when you're thinking about going solo, this is especially true in the early days. If you if you want to stay solo, you can expect to spend at least a quarter, if not half, of your time connecting, networking, marketing, prospecting, accounting. You can expect to spend about a quarter to half of your time running your business, not working in your business. Mm -hmm. So not writing code. And there are, I mean, there are certainly ways to defray that. You can bring in accountants, you can bring in marketers, you can, you know, hire or contract out or partner or whatever, but then you're just trading that time for, uh, of, you know, say sales and marketing to managing and coordinating, then you're still not going to be writing code with that time right. for the most part, especially early on. Yeah. I, I agree with you. And that's, it's ironic that that is the case because, you know, at that point you are almost back to managing people again, if that mm -hmm. was your goal to eliminate that or get away from that. Now, granted, it's not like that's your full-time job. You're not a manager, but it's, it becomes a part of it. And so, you know, I've always tried mm -hmm. to minimize that as well. So my goal, one of my goals with my own business is to, is to try to find a way to spend as much time actually doing the work that I want to do as possible and minimizing all that other stuff and finding ways to minimize that without having to hire people. You know, I, I'm kind of skipping ahead here, but I do have um, an accountant, a firm that I work with yeah. to handle that, but I do all the bookkeeping. All they're really doing is, you know, the tax filings and so on. Um, but I am the salesperson. I am the guy that's out there, you know, I'm writing the blog posts. I'm doing some handling the marketing, you know, mm -hmm. all that stuff. And some of it I love. I really do. Um, you know, some of it can drive you nuts. You know, you're the first line of tech support, customer service, and so on. Right. So we're jumping all over the place here, but kind of getting back to this, this is a good fit for you. And I mentioned being self-disciplined. We started to mention that you have to wear many different roles. I think kind of implied in all this is that you need to have a, a good head for business. You know, you have to, if you are not a good business person, you're not going to survive. You can learn to be one, but you know, that, that's challenging. Um, yeah. It's, it's a little scary right now how parallel our notes are so far. <laughs> I, Cause I think, yeah, I bet if we talk to other people who have done this, regardless of whether they're in the net suite space or not, they'd have similar bullet points under this. One of the big mm -hmm. ones I have though, is that if you are a social butterfly, if you're the person that likes to, you know, um, have constant human interaction, <laughs> Uh, this might not be for you either. And I know a lot of people who tried to go out on their own that are like that, that are, you know, they're very sociable. They, you know, they have to be chit chatting all the time and hanging out on, you know, by the water cooler or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's t tough for them. Right. I mean, I think a lot of people right now are going through that, you know, because a lot of people are now working from home and I think it can be a shock to a lot of people, but if you're choosing to do this and go out on your own, um, it's certainly something to keep in mind. That doesn't mean you're not going to have physical interactions with people. You're not going to, you could still meet with clients, still go to conferences and meetups and stuff like that. But if you need that, like that constant social, I don't even know what word to use there. Right? It's just that, you know, if that needs to be a constant part of your life, mm -hmm. then this might not be for you because the closest you're going to get most of the time is just chatting or, you know, a zoom call or whatever. And it's not the same, let's be honest. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of people will go, you know, work in a coffee shop instead. It sounds like what you're driving at is more like if, if you, if you are incapable of sitting alone in an office, like <laughs> all day, every day, completely by yourself, then it gets very difficult. It's very lonely, right? Running a business by yourself. It's very lonely. Uh, it, which is why I yeah. mentioned find some peers to uh, to commiserate with for sure. Mm -hmm. I do want to to jump back to to something you said or started to say, and 
I think just, you know, having a head for business and things like that, just being great at whatever skill you have, just being a great sweet script developer does not make a business. That's not good enough to, to just build a business. You can't uh, be great and then put up a website and say, hey, I'm great, and expect people to flock to you and throw money at you. That's very naive. Yeah. I definitely agree with you there. It's no guarantee of success. Ironically, though, I also know people that have gone out on their own who aren't great at the thing that they're doing, and they've been extremely successful at it because mm -hmm. they're really good at some other aspect of the business, like marketing. So you can be a so-so web developer, or web designer, or whatever, you know, or illustrator, or whatever, and you can be awesome at marketing and pull it off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... That's the other thing, like don't let that hold you back. Obviously, the better you are at what you're trying to do, if you're like if you're an awesome sweet script developer, then you know, great. And you should be as, as good at that as you possibly can and continue to like try to get better and better at that thing. Um, but if you're not awesome at it, don't let that necessarily hold you back. I mean, if you suck at it, you're the worst step sweet, <laughs> sweet script developer the world's ever seen, then yes, please <laughs> find something else to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you don't have to be an expert at it. Would you agree with that? I mean, it's hard for you because I look at you and you are the, you're the I've said before, you're the sweet script god. So you are an expert. It doesn't apply to you. But do you feel the same way about that? But I didn't go solo as a sweet script developer. True. Yeah, that's not the the skill that I was was offering to the market. That's not the that's not the problem I was trying to solve. I 100% agree. You do not need to be uh, the greatest, bestest sweet script developer to to run your own business to to go solo. You don't even need to be the best to be an expert. You just need to know more than the people you are serving. Most. Sweet script customizations aren't super highly technical, really complex processes. Many of them are, but not most of them. Yeah. And they're still very, very impactful to the, the, the businesses that need them. So you can be, you know, good. You don't have to be amazing or great. You can be good and still be offer incredible value to your clients. But you have to find and build relationships with those clients. You cannot just expect to put out your shingle and have people line up. That's not how it works. Yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely. So the next thing that I had down to talk about is, is the pros and cons and the risks and re potential rewards of going so well. Um, do you want to talk a little about that? Sure. Where would you like to begin? That was a bunch of questions. Yeah, it is a lot sort of rolled into one. And we've kind of talked about or implied some of these, I think, already. But and we could go on and on with you know, huge lists of pros and cons and mm -hmm. the potential risks and potential rewards. The, the biggest pro for me in going solo and being solo is freedom. The freedom to, you know, work when I want to some extent, where I want, you know, choose the projects and the clients I want to work on. Even, you know, as, as crazy as it sounds, you, to, to choose um, how much I want to make or how little I want to make. You know, I can choose how much effort I want to put in at any given time. Um, and that's a freedom that I don't think you're going to get unless you work for yourself. You know? And it's, 
that's the number one thing. I would just sort of roll that all up as the, the biggest pro going solo is freedom. That is that also your biggest con? It can be because it goes back <laughs> to that self discipline thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're going to have that freedom, but you still have to do the work. Yeah, because <laughs> right? having all that choice means you can also choose to not do stuff. Right. So if you are like me and prone to distraction, it can be very difficult. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine a bigger pro though than than setting my own schedule and working on, for the most part, the things that I want to work on. Research and writing and that sort of thing. I can't imagine any other way of living now, now that I've seen the dark side. Right. I don't, and I don't know any, I mean, there are other pros, right? Financial and so on and so forth. Um, but the biggest con for me for going solo and I said this earlier, is that it's all on you. It's a lot of responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. you, I mentioned all the different hats you have to wear and roles you have to assume in, in being a solopreneur, you know, being on your own. And um, it's a lot. It's a lot of responsibility, especially if you have a family to support or, you know, whatever. It's just it, that's the biggest con that I see. Yeah. Uh, and then... You, another characteristic, perhaps, you have to be very comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> it is naturally, inherently risky. It, you are never certain about anything. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, that's a whole, like that we could open up a can of worms there by talking about that. Um, but it's a funny little side story. And again, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but a few years ago, I was working with a financial planner um, and I took one of those tests, tests that helps you determine or helps them determine how, how much risk you're willing to take or not. And of course, for me, like I am risk averse, like, you know, from a financial standpoint, like I just, I avoid risk at any at any cost, right? I do my best to avoid it. And I remember the financial planner sort of laughing and, and said to me, you know, it's just so funny that you're like that because going out on your own, running your own business is probably one of the riskiest things you can do. And so, I, you know, and I thought about that and it's like, yeah, maybe that's why I'm risk averse on all the other financial stuff because I, all my risk right now is just in my, my, solo business you know that I, that's as much risk as i can take i can't take any more um but it's it, it is it was an interesting uh observation that he made and it, you know it, and i had not realized it at that point that i you know here i am thinking that i you know i'm the most risk averse person you would ever meet and at the same time you know look at what i'm doing so and I don't know that you ever get comfortable with that, by the way. I don't know anybody that is always comfortable with risk, but obviously the more comfortable you are, the probably the better. <laughs> Otherwise you just, you know, it is a lot of stress for sure. Yeah. If you just, if you just want to be comfortable, keep a job, just stay with a job. So another con that I have, and this is definitely, you were saying earlier how for you, you're easily distracted, I guess is a good way to sum, to sum it up. Mm -hmm. And for me, I am a natural workaholic. And so if you're prone to that, then this can, being a, you know, a solopreneur can be, oh, it can be a very toxic combination. And we, yes. you know, we had our episode about burnout um, so we don't need to bring that back up, but I think it's very easy to 
end up in those burnout places and phases and so on. Yeah. So again, it goes back to self-discipline and you've got to discipline yourself to get up and work. And you also have to discipline yourself to, or have the discipline to know when enough is enough. Mm -hmm. That's been my biggest challenge throughout my entire solo uh, career for sure. And to that end, you have to be able to say no. If you say yes to everyone who comes your way, will very quickly get in over your head. Yeah. Which... Sorry, go ahead. Well, it's a nice segue to something I have in my notes, which is a little bit... It's probably going to shift us away from your pros and cons, but... I think one of the first things you should be thinking about is who is your business for and who is it not for? So I'm going to put a pin in that and we can come back to your, your pros and cons. I think that is a good segue and it leads to what, something I was going to talk about next was almost, what's it, well, I think it's a good segue, which, which, which is uh, what should you do before going solo? And one of the first things I have down is line up business but before you can even do that you need to do what you said which is who are you what kind of business are you trying to drum up who Mm -hmm. is your ideal customer what are you doing (laughs) what are you offering yeah i think there's there's definitely one style of business which is more just um sort of just the lifestyle business right and you can absolutely make that work with Sweet script development, you can, you know, if you, this is maybe the one way that, that I can think of to, to sort of still just spend most of your time sitting at a desk and writing code is if you sort of just want, if you're, if you only want to just like, well, I'm good at sweet script, so I'm going to write sweet script and it just needs to. Uh, you know, sustain my lifestyle, then great. You know, you can either one, keep your job again, (laughs) or you can, you know, start a business and just be a contractor, right? Find a recruiting or staffing agency or two that you consistently work with and let them feed you work. Uh, You can definitely do it that way. I would not call that building a business. And that's not meant in any sort of uh, disparaging way, but you're just you're just working for the staffing agencies at that point. You're not building any sort of long term asset, or you know, innovating or or solving some new problem in the marketplace. And that's fine. Not everyone has to do that. So that is definitely one way to just if you just want that lifestyle business, which is basically that means your business is for you. You're not building something to solve a larger problem in the market or the world. But for some people, it is what they want to build a business around. And if that's you, then you have to sort of decide who do you want to serve? Who is that ideal client? What problems do you want to help them solve? And then what is your involvement? What are the various levels of your involvement in moving them towards a solution to those problems? Yeah. And I think that's, you know, we've talked, we've had episodes in the past about specialization and so on. I think that's something else to kind of bring up right here, which is if you, if you have something that you want to specialize in, or maybe even if you don't, it's something to consider early on. You know, it may, it might not make sense for you. You might not have figured that out just yet. Like, you know, what specifically do you want to offer? But the more laser focused you can get on that, the better. And the sooner you can do it, the better. Um, and I would encourage you, if you haven't listened to that other episode, go back and, and do that because it it's, I mean, we've talked about all the different benefits of specialization, but one of them is clearly, you know, you're, you're going to get more um, 
focused on, or it'll become more clear to you who you're trying to attract in terms of clients and customers. And that just makes everything else easier. You know, how you're going to market to them, where, and so on. But just hanging out, like you said a couple of times, just hanging out a shingle and saying, I'm a NetSuite, I'm a SuiteScript developer, you know. Okay, great. Yeah, <laughs> you're you probably know. going to have people knocking on your door, uh, uh -huh. virtual door, but it's, it's not necessarily going to be as successful as it otherwise could be. If you yeah. took the time to kind of do it right. You're going to have a lot of competition, I would say. Yeah. I, I doubt you will just put up a website and have people. Although, uh, that does bring me to something I, the back, let me, oh, wow. That brings me back to the first year being the easiest. Uh, and that's because the first year you have, you have this great story of, you know, oh, I finally told my boss to shove it and went out on my own. I'm a NetSuite developer. Does anyone have NetSuite work? And your family is going to tell everyone. Your friends are going to tell everyone they know. And like you, you have this, like this story that comes with its own marketing engine. And that usually lasts about a year. Sometimes longer for really lucky people, but usually that first year you can get a few clients just based on your current network. Like the people in your immediate closest circle will be happy to share your story and tell everyone they know. Uh, but after that, it gets real old and they don't do it anymore. <laughs> so they're bored of you being self-employed now. It's no longer new. It's no longer a, a great story. It's just part of who you are now. Yeah. All that goes away. And hopefully you spent that year building your own marketing engines, but no one ever does. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, it's, you're almost completely reliant upon your existing network at that point. You're mm -hmm. and your network being, you know, people you've worked with in the past, family and friends, you mentioned that. And it's, but it's completely out of your control, right? It's like, yes. so you have to do something where, you know, some of the marketing that you're doing is driven by you, you know, and not just, hey, I'm, this is what I'm doing now. It, you know, I'm, we, you know, we could talk about that two different ways to kind of get the word out beyond just family and friends and colleagues, sure. you know, but it's important that you do that because, and you, you have to constantly be doing that too. Like that's part mm -hmm. of what makes this challenging is even when things are going really well and your book solid or beyond solid, you should still be doing some marketing. Yeah. You know, like, right. You're bringing me very nicely to my next point of the feast famine cycle, another con of self-employment. If you're not spending your time, or like I mentioned, you know, 25 to 50% of your time marketing, networking, connecting, you are going to inevitably end up in this, this feast famine cycle where that whole first year you have this network underneath you, supporting you, sharing your story, getting you work. And so you're booked solid. And it's great. It's like easy. It's fun. It's exciting. And because you were booked solid, you weren't doing any marketing. And after a year or so, all that work dries up. And now you have no idea what to do. No one's knocking at your door. No one's, the phone's not ringing. No emails are coming in. And so you say, thus, obviously no money's coming in. So oh crap, now I have to do a bunch of direct outreach or I have to, you know, go find a recruiting firm or a contract or something like that. And so you do that and inevitably getting some work gets you more work, like leads to more work. And then what happens again? You're fully booked. You spend all that, all your time working, writing code. And then, I don't know, six months later, it all dries up. 
and you get into this constant cycle of too much to do, nothing to do, too much to do, nothing to do. And it's horribly unpredictable and stressful and terrifying. It's awful. Yeah. You, again, you have to constantly be marketing, even when you don't think you need uh, business. Mm -hmm. Marketing has a yeah. long tail. It does. It also has a bad name and a bad reputation. It doesn't have to be a dirty word. Right. And that's, you know, the, I think one of the things that the assumption is that you, you market because you need business. Like that's one of the goals, but really I see it as it's a way to build awareness, right. Um, and, get, and kind of get a name for yourself out there, you know, have people know who you are and what you do, which then leads to getting business. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, Again, we could probably talk about this forever, but I do think the best time to be marketing is always. <laughs> Three months <laughs> right? ago. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's a big part of like what uh, what I do. And I, I know it's a big part of what you do as well. It, you know, it's um, we're doing that right now. Right. I mean, even this podcast is yeah. a way to kind of get the word out about who we are and so on and so forth. Um but yeah, I would, I think besides writing code, uh, marketing in its various forms is probably the, you know, the second biggest uh, use of my time. And it's not a bad thing. I mean, I love the blogging aspect of what I do and so on. So it, 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 I guess that's one of the things for me, it does, that doesn't feel like work. I, I love it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, um, I would say even way more of my time is marketing is doing research and writing and you know, ideating, brainstorming, to, and doing that stuff on behalf of my potential clients and then sharing what I find mm -hmm. to expose more people to my thinking and hopefully, right, hopefully attract them to uh, work with me. Right. There are other ways to, to do marketing or other tactics, other methodologies to go about it or like direct outreach type of stuff. This is not a marketing episode though, so <laughs> we will not get into that stuff, but it doesn't have, it, it can actually be really enjoyable to do that stuff. You might find that you enjoy it even more than writing code, perhaps again, depending on sort of how you choose to go about this. Right. And I, the other thing I would add about that is that you don't have necessarily to spend, a, I would first, I'd say a lot of money to market no, or potentially any money. Like I've never spent a dollar marketing that I can think of ever. Maybe like the money for a, a domain name. Right. <laughs> other than that, it's largely just time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I have, very low overhead, very low expenses uh, as a as a solo business. I let's see, it's you know it's twenty twenty tax season right now, so I I I spent less than ten thousand dollars in total expenditures last year for my business. Yeah, and that was doing a whole bunch of uh, system upgrades for recording and things like that. So that's like an unusually high amount for me. And it's still under $10,000. The overhead is very little. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I don't think we've said anything about that uh, up to this point, but you know, this isn't the kind of business that you need a lot of money to start. I, no. I would argue that you probably do want to have a nice cushion, you know, kind of a, a runway, so to speak. Um, you know, to kind of get you off the ground financially with this, but you don't have to pour tons of money into the business in order to get going. Mm. There are things you're going to need, and we'll talk about that in a minute, that could be expensive if you choose to go in those directions. But, um, I mean, think about it. What do you really need? You probably have most of it already. You're mm -hmm. probably, if you're listening to this podcast and you're doing it on your 
notebook or whatever, um, you're probably ready to go right now, you know, for the most part. Um, so, you, yeah. And that's one of the benefits of doing this. Right? It's not like you're buying into a franchise or you're, you know, you need to buy some huge piece of equipment. So that cost me 50 bucks to start my LLC. And I already had a computer and an internet connection. So I was pretty much ready to go. <laughs> you don't even need the internet connection. Just go to Starbucks or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Pre COVID, like at was, least. Yeah, there was a time where that was actually reasonable. I don't know whether it's right or not, but it's another thing. Yeah. So the other thing, one thing I do want to tie up on talking about, you know, who do you want to serve and, and using your thing is a little bit loaded, but you know, leaning on your network. If your network now is mostly your peers, like other sweet script developers they're probably not your clients. <laughs> it's going to be really hard to get Nancy development work through them. So you should be thinking now about expanding that. Uh, and again, thinking about who you want to serve and starting to look for those people and connect with them or figuring out where they hang out, uh, like online, not in the physical world <laughs> online. Yeah. You know, if there's a, a subreddit or a Slack community or, or something like that and, and just sort of uh, be a wallflower in those communities and start to observe and listen and pay attention to what they see as problems and try to find an intersection between their problems and your ability to participate in the solutions to those problems. Yeah, that's a very good point. It goes kind of goes back to something I was going to talk about, which is what things should you do before going solo? And I think, you know, you hit on it right there. Like build a network before you go solo, build the network before you need it, because you're going to need it almost right away. Um, try to line up some business ahead of time if you can. Uh, and, and try to validate what it is that you think you're going to offer to your customers, you know, like you might have what you think is the greatest idea in the world, but it sure would be nice to talk to some people who may or may not need it to see what they think before you just go out on your own and, you know, take a wild stab at it. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I recommend, and I've done this a couple of times, is take, to see if you can get your current employer to potentially be a client. And um, you might be surprised mm -hmm. at how willing they are to do that or, or not. And it might surprise you just as much, but, uh, you know, they, they know what you can do and you, you know, you know what to expect and so on. And so that, that's something to consider, you know, if you're going so well. Yeah. If you have a really good relationship and a good, if you have good leadership and a good relationship with your current employer, you can absolutely do that or something like that. Like they, I, I told my employer, I think 15 months, it ended up being like 15 months in advance. I, uh, I told them a year ahead of time, you know, Hey, I'm planning on going out on my own on this date. Um, and so I, I trusted them. We had a great relationship still do actually. And so they were extremely supportive in helping me do that. They've been a client a few times now. They've referred other work to me. So if you have that sort of relationship, that's a great place to start. Yeah. You'll know if you don't have that sort of relationship too. Maybe you don't, and that's why you look, you're thinking about going solo. Yeah. But that is absolutely one place to, to start. Mm -hmm. So another thing I had down was to talk about when you do decide to go solo, mm -hmm. there are a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, you can just make one big leap, go from, you know, working full time to, okay, now I'm on my own. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to do it gradually and kind of dovetails with what you were just saying, you know, about the relationship you have with your current employer. It may right. be possible to sort of, you know, 
wean yourself from them and have them wean themselves off you by just sort of taking baby steps towards, you know, this, uh, you know, having a solo business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've always that. taken the big leap, you know, always <laughs> been like, okay, I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I couldn't too. wait. Yeah. It's like, and it gets like, it drives you nuts. Even the delay, like, I don't know about you, but when I made this the decision to go out on my own, it was like, okay, I want to wake up tomorrow and be on my own. <laughs> All right. It's not realistic to do that, but um, it's tempting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's something to think about, you know, like there may be a way to kind of get your solo business going, uh, you know, as sort of a side hustle, depending on, you know, what you're doing and so forth. You've got to be careful with that, but right. it's something to think about. Um, I'd be careful if you signed a non-compete in doing that. Right. Um, but yeah, I, there you can, you know, maybe your employer will sort of, slowly ramp you down to, you know, move you to a contractor role, then slowly ramp your time down or, or something like that. Maybe not. Maybe you don't have that. Certainly there's groundwork you can lay. You can find a name. You can incorporate an LLC or or not. Or you can you know, get a website sort of up and running. You can start thinking about sort of the messaging start again connecting with and researching the market you want to serve the types of people you want to serve yeah. and that can be when you're a solo operator you can get really really specific with the people you serve and the types of problems you solve you don't need twenty-five thousand leads coming in you can maybe serve 10 clients a year without, you know, overworking yourself. (laughs) So you don't need this massive uh, market. You can be, you can get very narrow and very specific and then just dominate that tiny, tiny little micro niche. So, uh, you know, we also have um, in our sort of outline for this episode, I, I had something down, which is what do you actually need to go solo? And by that, I mean, you know, services and things that you should get in place before you are officially on your own. And we're not going to go into all the details of this, but I do want to mm-hmm. rattle off some of them. You, you should probably have a system in place to manage the accounting and bookkeeping aspect of your business. You know, whether that's QuickBooks or I use FreshBooks or maybe you're using NetSuite. I mean, well, go for it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But you're going to want a way, obviously, to keep track of, you know, your time potentially, uh, definitely your expenses, customer invoices and so on. So just keep that in mind. And sort of going hand in hand with that, I would encourage you to find an accountant um, as early as possible, and preferably somebody that understands the sort of nuances of a solo business. You know, I have worked with a bunch of different accountants over the years, mostly because I've moved around um, Mm -hmm. over the years, but, and I used to think I needed somebody local. And I've worked with accountants who are used to working with what they consider to be small businesses um, who are looking to grow, you know, a small business that has multiple employees and their plan is to grow larger, which is totally not what I want. (laughs) And that kind of blows a lot of accountants' minds, you know, like, well, why wouldn't you want to hire more people? You know, why wouldn't you? So if you can find somebody that understands uh, again, this, the solo business, um, the nuances of it, I think the better off you're going to be. And I think they'll be able to give you good advice um, as a result of them understanding what you're doing. So, Eric, do you have an accountant that, that you use and do you feel the same way about that? I don't. I don't have an accountant. Um, I do have a lawyer. I do have insurance. Um, which 
a lot of so like insurance for instance a lot of um, contracts a lot of employers a lot of staffing agencies etc will require that you have insurance if you are mm-hmm. you know incorporated on your own especially so uh, i do not have an accountant i i do use quickbooks online or quickbooks self-employed i think um i find the bookkeeping to be pretty straightforward pretty simple i my uh, it helps that my dad was a cpa and i had to do a ton of accounting work in the past on in my netsuite career i've worked on a ton of accounting and uh you know, accounting projects. So mm-hmm. I just do it myself. I find it takes very little time except at tax time. Tax time is a pain in the butt. Yeah. For sure. I am actually considering after the last couple of years, I am definitely considering um, uh, adding an accountant, finding one that can help, especially with the way that taxes are shifting for online uh, purchases, state taxes, and EU taxes, you know, VAT, things like that. So that complicates it, but still, um, I, I still do my own for now. Yeah. So you brought up some other things, and then too, you mentioned having a lawyer. I think that's, you know, if you can find somebody to, even if it's just knowing that you have somebody that if you're going to need them, they're there, mm-hmm. uh, but you should talk to somebody, you know, yeah, at the very least, like referrals. ask around, you know, like try yeah. to meet some, um, even if that means, you know, spending a hundred hour, a hundred hours, a hundred dollars or so. Yeah. And you're going to need potentially some legal forms, you know, like, uh, I have, three documents I use for almost all clients, um, a master service agreement, um, scope of work and an NDA and, you know, having an account or a lawyer rather look at those, um, is potentially a good idea. Again, like we're not lawyers or anything. So, you know, <laughs> take our advice. It's just that, you know, it's not professional advice, but I would definitely have a lawyer look at those documents if you have them. And if you don't have them, consider getting them or researching uh, how to get those documents. Um, And then obviously uh, the other things you're going to need, we kind of mentioned it before, and it's not really very much, but you're going to need some hardware. You need a computer, obviously, and some software and Mm -hmm. website, preferably, or at the very least, the LinkedIn profile. (laughs) Uh, But you need need an online presence. And uh, so this is things to consider, you know, getting set up sooner than later you yeah also mentioned insurance and yeah that's, mm-hmm. i have that down and also um something else to think about maybe not right off the bat but is you know it's one thing to be working for somebody else and maybe they have some kind of a retirement plan that they're offering or whatever 401k right. or whatever but you should think about trying to continue that on your own by all means and um I have a SEP, which is kind of a self-employment version of a 401k. Right. But we we mentioned earlier, you know, that we're not financial planners, but you should talk to one, you know, and try to find somebody, you know, that people recommend in your area and just talk to them. You know, maybe they can give you some practical, affordable ways to just, you know, continue to make uh, or to, to do retirement planning and if you are cringing at the talk of lawyers and accountants and insurance and financial planning stay with your job (laughs) yeah it doesn't go away so the last sort of scary thing that i'll talk about and again you know our disclaimer at the beginning of this episode still applies here, but you need to think about how, like the form of business that you're starting. And by that, I mean, is it a a corporation? Is it an LLC? Are you just going to go as a solo uh, proprietor? And if you don't know what those things are, don't worry about it, but research them. Mm -hmm. My only advice in that area, and again, it's, I'm not a lawyer, 
not an accountant, but if you can do it as a solo proprietor, do it. <laughs> um, I'll just leave it at that. Are you incorporated or a solo proprietor? You're incorporated, I, right? I'm incorporated. I'm an LLC partnership. Okay. My wife is a partner in the business. I'll be the silent one. Um, okay. I have put up as many um, separations, as many walls between business and personal finance as I can. As I am very risk averse in my my personal assets. So I do not want any uh you know anything that goes wrong with the business, I do not want that to be able to or I want to put up as many barriers as possible to that passing through to my personal assets. The United States is a very litigious place. So I try to defend against that as best I can with things like insurance and having an actual incorporated business that has totally separate bank accounts and um, just as many walls as I can. I don't even take like the tax credits or, or tax, I forget. I don't take the tax bonuses for working from home. You know, I don't deduct any portion of my rent or my, my mortgage rather or my utilities or anything like that. I don't take any of that stuff because again, I just want to leave as many barriers as possible between the business and the personal. You don't have to do that stuff. Again, that's all, it's all about building your own risk profile. That's, yeah. that's mine. Yep. And again, you should definitely talk to you. And when it comes to the type of business that you may or may not be starting, I would recommend talking to both a lawyer and an accountant to help you figure out the, both legal and tax implications of the different forms of business. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So just a few other things that I have written down here, special considerations. I, this is how I phrase it, special considerations for NetSuite solopreneurs. You know, you need to think about having a NetSuite account. You should think about whether or not joining the Sweet Cloud Developer Network makes sense to you. And if you don't know what that is, look it up. Um, it can be expensive and kind of tricky getting into that. Um, and but it's also uh, but the only way I know of to get an account for yourself, other than actually signing up as a, a customer. Customer, right? Mm -hmm. Which is also not a, an expensive thing to do, but maybe it makes sense for you to do it. I have been. Uh, contacting the SDN every few months for about four years and I have never once received a single response from them. <laughs> so even if you do yell at them saying, take my money, please, um, they may not respond to you. I don't know where they're looking. They're probably more focused on working with large partners and, you know, bringing or getting their requests and accounts set up. But as an individual, I have not received, I cannot get their attention at all. So be aware of that. I think it's especially difficult to get support in various forms from NetSuite as a solopreneur. It's something to keep in mind and again, topic of a probably a much longer conversation. We've mentioned it before and it's challenging, but that's definitely one. And these are somewhat unique issues with you know, being a solo NetSuite professional. Yeah. Um, and there, there are other platforms where it's a little bit different, but it's just one of the oddities, I guess, of the NetSuite space. So I think that pretty much wraps up what I had. Do you have anything else for this episode? Yeah, and forever, I right? think we can touch on them shortly. I, I mentioned before... And this is fits perfectly into like, what do you need or what should you do before going solo? I, more than the tactical stuff of like the physical things you need or the, I don't know, the SaaS products you should use or anything like that. More than that, I think you need, again, you need to know who you want to serve very specifically and what problems you're going to help them solve and how you're going to help them solve those. 
um, and to know how you're going to help them solve, you, you need some sort of business model. You know, what sort of services are you going to provide? If it's just sweet script work, if you're just going to be a pair of hands, and again, I don't mean just uh, in a degrading or demeaning way, but if that's the only thing you're going to do and you're going to go with that sort of contractor model, that's great. Um, you should know that. Know that, decide that, and be aware of you know, how you're going to market that, how you're going to charge, those sorts of things. There are other business models that move you more into selling your head instead of your hands, being a consultant, being an advisor, being a mentor, being a community builder, those sorts of things. There are tons of books on <laughs> different business models. So I think you need an idea of what your business model is. That doesn't mean you need like a full business plan to submit to a bank for a loan or something like that, but you should have an idea of your service structure and how you're going to charge for your work. You should also have a set of mentors that don't have to know you exist, but a consistent set of people who you know, so do your research, start learning, and find a set of people who write, who publish, who share about business that aligns with your vision for yourself and your business and follow them relentlessly. <laughs> Read all their books, listen to their podcasts, their blogs, whatever whatever media they choose. So mine are certainly Jonathan Stark and Philip Morgan. Uh, we'll link to show notes or link in the show notes to, to those people again, as I'm sure I've brought them up about a dozen times. But... They don't have to be yours, but you should have some models to follow. Again, they don't even have to know you exist, but you should know they exist and follow them. And again, find some peers, some people to commiserate with. Find a Tim or your Eric, um, because it is mandatory for your mental health, I think. No one. I'm glad you brought up um, Jonathan Stark and Philip Morgan. Um, you know, you and I both are fans of them, and uh, I would throw a couple other people in there as well. Paul Jarvis um, is definitely one, and you know, we'll link to them in the show notes. But you, you, you need to be uh, studying what those types of people do and the advice that they're giving as much if not more than uh, reading blogs about the technical aspects of what you're doing mm -hmm. you know it's just funny okay oh, just like you would just like you probably have done to get where you are in software development you have to invest the same sort of thing in business right business is a it's another skill set it's a different skill set that you need to invest in if you actually want to build a business. Yeah. Right. All right. So should we wrap this up? It sounds like I think we have exhausted my notes. I managed yeah. to stay off the hourly billing soapbox yeah we i thought about that in the end and we haven't brought it up but we've talked about it before and i think we'll probably talk about it again hourly billing value pricing and so on and i'll depends. just record myself ranting in a room we'll, we'll post that. <laughs> we need to get uh you know jonathan stark on to talk to us about that he's he's you know, the voice of reason, the absolute authority in my mind on that. Sure. So yeah. We'll do our best to lure him in. It's a big contributor to that feast famine cycle I mentioned. Yeah. That's all I'll say about it. Yeah, I think we've exhausted my notes. That sounds like yours as well. So should we move into our 
our cool things for the week. Absolutely. Do you want to go first? Do you have something? I do not want to go first. Could you go first? Uh-oh. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, and this is a really, I think, uh, an appropriate uh, recommendation based on this episode. There's a, a book that I've, I've had on my wish list for a very long time, and I actually finally started checking it out um, earlier uh, this week. It's called, it's been out for uh, a few years. It's called The Million Dollar One Person Business. Uh, make great money, work the way you like, have the life you want. It's by Elaine Kohfeldt, I believe is how you pronounce her last name. Um, it's not necessarily a blueprint for success uh, for solo businesses, but it's what I, what I like about the book is it has a lot of uh, case studies. She's talked to a lot of people who run solo businesses and have been extremely successful in them. Uh, the thing to keep in mind about the book, if you decide to check it out, is that, uh, you know, they're sometimes talking about uh, uh, revenue, not profit. So when you hear a million dollar business, you're not necessarily talking about you're going to like walk away with a million dollars or whatever, right. <laughs> um, although you might. Uh, and it's just, but it's just really an interesting book in that you get to read about how other people have uh, started solo businesses and the challenges they face and so on. So I thought that was a very appropriate uh, recommendation for this episode. And we'll, again, link to that in the show notes. So did I buy you enough time to think of something if you hadn't already thought of one, Eric? <laughs> no, not really. You want me to go uh, slower and keep talking about that book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could you give us the cliff notes, please? I'm no, sure, uh, sure. No. <laughs> I, I think I want to... They're not really cool stuff. I, or it's related to what I just talked about. I have been, and it's related to finding one, both a mentor and a peer group. So full disclosure, I, I talk about Philip Morgan as one of my mentors. I have also hired him uh, as a coach. I have joined both his one-on-one -on -one coaching program in the past, and I am currently going through his um, expertise incubator which is essentially a community of practice. So it, he, he organizes these cohorts of self-employed individuals who are looking to build and cultivate valuable expertise. So I'm going through that right now, and it has been incredible to have, again, a group of people around you who are maybe a little bit further behind, maybe a little bit further ahead, but going through this solopreneurship experience and just having that peer group, whether it's just people you know or people you join and, and pay to join, either way. Um, so a, a plug for the Expertise Incubator convened by Philip Morgan. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. If, do you know if he is, if that's open right now? I know that sometimes these types of programs are book solid or, you know, a long waiting list. But... It is not open right now that I know okay. of. It's a nine-month program. And I think he opens it every January. Okay. Yeah, I just... We'll Don't quote me on that. Summer. We'll link to it and you can go research and see. He also does a bunch of shorter workshops that are not nine months. They're usually, I think, like four to eight weeks, uh, you know, once weekly workshops. So those are also worth a look. And this has turned into the Philip Morgan marketing episode. You're welcome, <laughs> Philip. <laughs> That's great. Well, again, we'll link to that in the show notes. I pulled it up and yeah, he's got a... Yeah, there's a couple pages on his site about it and how to get on the, the interest list, I think he calls it. So, all right. Well, on that note, I think we are done. I as think as we you're can right. be for such a deep topic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was just the overview. We could probably take each bullet point and pick it apart for a whole episode. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, we will wrap this up. 
And we hope you join us again next time for more Sweet Script Stories. Bye-bye. I need a new outro.